All right, good. I think uh, we are live. So hello, everyone, um, and welcome uh, to another uh, quantum, chaos, quantum Chaos seminar. Uh, thank you for joining us. We have a, a pretty nice turnout today. Um, <clears throat> so before uh, we start, as, as always, let me just remind you that um, so you, uh, as usual, be uh, seeing the, the seminar uh, on the on the live stream, and you can uh, we encourage you to interact with us and, and with the speaker, uh, asking questions through the live chat, and you can do that uh, if you want, you know, in the in the middle of the talk. But you can also, I mean, yeah, you will have plenty of time for questions uh, at the end. All right, so today we have a, a, a very special seminar. We are very happy to welcome Adolfo del Campo from the Donostia. International Physics Center. Um, Adolfo is a leading expert in, in many topics like quantum control and shortcuts to diabaticity, quantum thermodynamics, and dynamics of phase transitions, among others. Um, he got his uh, PhD uh, at the University of Basque Country and then uh, held postdoc and research associate positions in many places, uh, including UM, Imperial College, and Los Alamos National Lab. Um, Adolfo was then um, a tenured associate professor at UMass Boston until 2018, uh, when he moved uh, to Bilbao to the Anosti International Physics Center, where uh, he's now an Iker Vasque research professor. Um, so Adolfo, once again, thank you very much for showing us today and take it away whenever you want. Oh, thanks. Thanks, uh, Pablo and Peter. Yeah. So it's a pleasure to give this talk. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, the topic I'm going to cover is about quantum chaos and the interplay with the coherence. So it's a long standing issue. And uh, yes, I want to start by um, uh, wait a second, uh, uh, presenting uh, the research group. As you say, we are in Bilbao, is the city with the Guggenheim Museum over here. And uh, well, it's a picture of the, of the group. Uh, the work I, I, I'm going to present has been done in collaboration with Aurelia Chenu, who is also at the IPC. Uh, Luis Pedro Garcia Pintos, who was a postdoc at UMass Boston and is now at Maryland. And Seng Yu Su, who was a, a, took a sabbatical at uh, UMass Boston and is now back to Suzhou University. Uh, and as collaborators, uh, I want to also mention uh, Javier Molina Villaplana, who is in Spain, in Cartagena. And Thomas Prosen at Ljubljana, uh, Julian Soner at Genet, and Tassi Takayanagi at uh, Kyoto. <laughs> yeah, so some, some more group members here, but essentially the work I'm going to present involves these people. Good. So, what I want to say for, uh, it's essentially two ideas. Yes? One is about um, how extreme can the coherence be? And in order to do that, what I'm going to do is to first introduce a general protocol to engineer uh, the dynamics of a system that is open. So I, I will make the dynamics open just by adding noise, uh, using noise, classical noise, as a resource. And this can be added, for instance, to the coupling constants of local operators, of local uh, interactions in a given, in a given uh, Hamiltonian. Or the interesting part will come uh, when you add it to, to random metrics operators. And we will see there are some notion of extreme decoherence. So this is the first part of the talk. And the second one is going to be more what the title advertises, which is the interplay between quantum chaos and decoherence. And essentially, you know, once the system is open, you know, the coherence is of course a property of open systems. Uh, then maybe some of the tools we use for isolated systems, like the spectral form factor, are not readily available. So the first thing will be to introduce an analog of the spectral form factor for open systems. Uh, I will characterize it. There happens to be some features uh, which are prominent, and there will be a competition of time scales which explains this interplay between quantum chaos and the coherence. Right, so, you know, the coherence. Yeah? So, you know, this is an old subject uh, advanced by Dieter C and Wojciech Surek, uh, which is typically uh, used as a framework to explain the emergence of classical behavior from the quantum substrate. So this is a famous picture of the physics today by Boychev, Surek, uh, with Niels Bohr uh, dividing their more or less classical and uh, quantum boundaries. 
the way we uh, describe a system that is open embedded in an environment in quantum mechanics is standard is you know we take the uh, quantum state a density matrix for the system and uh, it's tensor product with the state of the environment we assume initially they are uncorrelated and uh, the time evolution is for the system and environment in the big Hilbert space is uh, unitary so I can I just have some time uh, evolution uh, unitary operator which is uh, generated by the total Hamiltonian of the system plus environment plus the interaction now of course the, the environment is something that is typically very large there are lots of degrees of freedom we typically cannot access it and uh, that's how uh, we uh, uh, end up uh, focusing on the state of the system yeah uh, so there's a standard uh, approach to characterize the dynamics of the system, only the reduced dynamics of the system, which is embedded in an environment, and typically takes this form. So it's, you know, there's a Hamiltonian. Uh, here is not just the Hamiltonian of the system; it's typically lamp shifted. But you know, uh, there's a unitary part and there is a dissipative part, which makes the dynamics non-unitary. Yeah. Uh, so this is the part you see. So, so the system and the environment interact. This leads to the buildup of quantum correlations between the two. Uh, as we cannot access the environment, we trace over it and uh, the dynamics effectively becomes non-unitary and uh, characterized by the coherence. Now, uh, there's uh, uh, a limit in which uh, master equations describing the state of the system take a universal form, and that's the case of Markovian uh, dynamics in which the uh, essentially, the, the memory of the environment is, is very short. It's, it's, and uh, then there's a famous theorem by Goran Lindblad, uh, I think 1978, which tells you that you can always write down the dissipator in this form. So this is the Lindblad form, uh, which involves some uh, Lindblad operators or bath operators. Uh, so, okay, this is, uh, we are going to focus pretty much on Markovian dynamics. I'm happy to, to discuss what could happen as otherwise. Uh, you know, there's a standard reference, uh, which is the, the, the book by Gregor and Peter Luxenia, which I love to, you know, to kind of uh, describe how, how, what's the formalism uh, to describe open quantum systems. Now, I want to emphasize that if the Lindblad operators, uh, which appear here in the master equation, happen to be Hermitian, so L alpha equal to L alpha at the end, uh, then the uh, Lin platform collapse into very simple expression, uh, which is just a double commutator of the Lin blood operator, which is now Hermitian. Now, I said th this is interesting, at least intuitively, because then you can see what is the effect of the coherence at this level is simply defacing, and it is defacing in the eigenbasis of the Lin blood operator, L alpha. Yeah. Uh, so let me just, uh, you know, uh, cover, uh, you know, an example. Uh, to get a bit of a, a, a intuition so here you know this is uh, slides is stolen pictures stolen from uh surex work uh, we just consider a uh, schrodinger cut or a quantum superposition between two gaussians uh, you know gaussian wave packets one center at position r in one dimension the other one center at position minus r uh, with some width uh, so we build up the density matrix taking the uh, product of the uh, state vector with the state vector at the uh, conjugate. And, you know, we plot it, it looks something like this. So it has diagonal and off-diagonal parts. We can say that the diagonal parts are more classical and, and uh, the off-diagonal ones are associated with quantum, quantum superposition. So this will be our initial state with the four peaks. And the typical effect of defacing in the position eigenbasis, in this case, will be to suppress quantum superpositions in the position eigenbasis. So that's why as a function of time, what you see is that only the diagonal peaks survive and the other diagonal ones decay yeah, or are dump out. So this is the, the typical effect of the coherence. In particular, in this case, what I have presented is, is uh, the typical features for quantum Brownian motion. And uh, even if this equation does not quite take the Lindblad form as written here, uh, we just focus on this term in the high temperature limit you see that uh, we have a double commutator in position. So position is here the Lindblad operator, which is unique. 
and is the one which is induces this defacing and uh, responsible for the decay of this uh, of diagonal elements of the density matrix. Now, one beautiful, simple, intuitive result uh, that go back to, go, goes back to Surek is what is the, the coherence time, the time scale in which the, this defacing acts. And it turns out that you can, you know, of course, uh, just uh, look at the size of the Schrodinger cut. So how large is the separation between the uh, Gaussian wave packets involved in the quantum superposition and measure it in units of the De Broglie wavelength. Yeah. So this lambda beta is the De Broglie wavelength. And essentially, you take the inverse square of that uh, uh, ratio, then you get the decoherence time. Yes, corrected with, with something which has unit of time, which is gamma is, is the constant here. But you know, this is very nice. Eh? You, you, it's, it's generic, actually. So but you have a slot in your cut, you measure in, in units of the probably wavelength in, the, in this case, because yes, you have K beta here, and you get an estimate of the decoherence time. The way uh, it was done back in the uh, um, um, 80s, I guess, uh, was by explicitly looking at uh, solutions or short time asymptotics of the uh, exact solution of the density matrix and, and see how the off diagonal elements decay. And, and you know, so it, it turns out this was the time scale. So I just want to do a small twist on this uh, to be a bit more general. Yeah? So I want to define or introduce the decoherence time for an arbitrary Markovian dynamics. And I'm going to show it that you can extract it from the survival probability or the fidelity between the initial state and the time dependent state. I consider that the initial state is pure and that's why the fidelity simplifies just to the uh, state at time t sandwiched by the uh, state vector at time zero. I want to focus just on the limb platform, yeah, Markovian limit. And what I'm going to do is to, you know, this the survival probability is a function of time. Uh, but it's differentiable, so I can make a short time expansion and I will have a term which is linear in time only because the dynamics is open. This term, this term will be absent if the dynamics is unitary, if the system is closed. And you know there will be a higher order terms of OT square. But yes, from the leading term, I can extract a time scale. And this time scale, you can write it nicely, is the inverse of the uh, average of the covariance of the limbled operators what the covariance is given here. Um, uh, and it turns out that it reproduces uh, the, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's really at the coherence time. Uh, you may say that the fidelity, you know, maybe it's not the best quantity because uh, it is actually not invariant under time, unitary time evolution. Uh, though at short times it is, you know, to order T it is. So let me just show that the same happens if you consider the purity. So I can just change the figure of merit a bit. You know, purity is really something that is preserved if the dynamics is unitary. Um, and then I can do the same thing. I can compute it exactly uh, and do the short time asymptotics exactly for Markovian dynamics. And so that the purity at time t is always the purity that at time zero. And you know, what I factor here is looks like the short time expansion of, expansion of an exponential function. Yeah, one minus d capital dt. So d, this d is what I call the, the coherence rate, but is just proportional to the inverse of the, the coherence time. Yeah, so capital d is just a rate, is how fast the system decoheres, and it's essentially just the inverse of the decoherence time. Now, why I like this way of defining the coherence time or the coherence rate is because this is basis independent. And I don't need to explicitly deal with the density matrix elements. Uh, I can just do the short time asymptotics, which is a trivial exercise of the purity of the fidelity and extract the, you know, extract this time scale. And once I have it, you know, this is the covariance evaluated in the initial state. This is something very easy to compute for any Markovian system, uh, you know, for any initial state. So, you know, I just to convince you that this is as good or even better than the early estimates. If we uh, focus in the case of quantum Brownian motion, uh, which is the one which was discussed in the early works by uh, Zurek, uh, then uh, you can see that indeed you recover the estimates, uh, you know, using our formula for with the with the covariance of the limbled operators, uh, you recover the Zurek estimate. Yeah. So this is some work which already goes back a couple of years, but uh, we are going to use it throughout this talk. 
So the coherence time is now defined. Yeah, so this is one, one crucial thing. Fine. So now I want to move uh, to the engineering of open quantum systems by adding noise as a resource. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so first, as I mentioned, you know, one way in which noise arises in quantum systems is just through their interaction with the environment. The system environment coupling leads to uh, this buildup of entanglement of quantum correlations and in a way make the energy levels of the system fluctuate. And this is what induces the uh, defacing in this case. There are other ways in which you can justify noise. So, so let me just mention some of them here for completeness. One is if you are timing your time evolution, you are describing time evolution according with a clock and this clock is not perfect yeah. and no clock is ever perfect. Yeah, Errors in timekeeping are completely equivalent to fluctuations in the Hamiltonian, yeah? stochastic fluctuations in the Hamiltonian. So it's a way of justifying, uh, you know, the uh, stochastic Hamiltonians or noisy Hamiltonians, fluctuating Hamiltonians are also called uh, in uh, just which arise from errors in timekeeping. There are arguments in quantum gravity how you know the, uh, the phasing or the coherence can emerge. Uh, there are modifications of quantum mechanics that also assume that perhaps you know uh, the dynamics is not really unitary, but you need some sources of noise. So well. Wow. Um, and but you know, yes, within a standard quantum mechanics, we can always add noise to coupling constants of a given parameter. As an experimentalist, I can modulate a control parameter and add a, a noise component to it. And this, this will be essentially our focus. Uh, but another possibility is also in the theory of continuous quantum measurements. Uh, the measurement feedback uh, gives rise essentially to a stochastic component. And that's yet another way in which noise can arise in a quantum system. Yeah, I'm pretty well, much going to focus on this setting where we, as an experimentalist, decide to add noise to a given coupling constant in a Hamiltonian. And so let me now introduce a bit the uh, description of uh, stochastic Hamiltonians. So I'm going to assume that my system is now isolated. Uh, it's, so it's described by a Hamiltonian, which has two parts. One is deterministic. You know, it's, it's const it, it can be modulated in time, but there's no uh, stochastic component to it. And I separate uh, the stochastic part. Gamma t here, it's a Gaussian uh, process, could be real, could be complex. I'm going to focus on real case. And B is uh, therefore the fluctuating operator. So in principle, as I have knowledge of the total Hamiltonian, uh, I could just propagate uh, any initial state by solving the Schrodinger equation now with the stochastic Hamiltonian. I could do this for a given realization of the noise. And then if I want to get some notion of what's typical, or, uh, I, I need to run many realizations of the noise and average over them. Yeah? So let me just mention that this, this description of stochastic Hamiltonians has also a long history. Uh, the way where I learned it was in a beautiful paper by Gerard Milburn. Uh, maybe there are some precedents, uh, but essentially he was just also considering some modification of quantum mechanics with uh, random phase fluctuations at short times and use this formalism. But it has appeared, Boudini did lots of systematic works and so on. <clears throat> so what we are going to do is, is rather than uh, you know, uh, solving this, the only way to solve this uh, is, is really numerically for a given realization of the noise. So we are going to introduce a, 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 a description which is effective for the average over many realizations of the noise. And in order to do this, uh, so here is what we have. So I'm going to introduce a, a noise average state of the system, which is, you know, I take uh, one of these uh, Schrodinger uh, ket states for a given realization. So this I call, and I build up the corresponding stochastic density matrix. And now I, aver, I average over many of them. Yeah? So this is what I'm doing. Well, you can show what is the uh, equation of motion of these noise average density, density matrix. And it's given here, but it's not particularly pretty. You know, it's, it's I mean, it's, it's in, intuitive in some sense. It has the, the deterministic part governs the, uh, the dynamics at the level of a kind of von Neumann uh, uh, um, equation of motion, this part, the unitary, the unitary part. 
And you see that uh, the stochastic uh, fluctuations uh, of the uh, B operator uh, give rise to this term, which is non-local in time. So in principle, captures non-Markovian effects. Here, the autocorrelation function of the noise uh, appears. And then the reason why I say it's not particularly pretty is that you, you see, we are looking at the noise average uh, density metrics, but it still depends on non-trivial averages of the stochastic density metrics. So here is the ensemble average over noise realizations. However, it's well known that if you uh, focus on the case of white noise, then everything is beautiful and wonderful because uh, you can just yes, substitute this uh, uh, autocorrelation function by the delta function. You can carry out the integral. And uh, this now the, the equation closes from the point of view that you just have essentially defacing. You know, this is just simplest equation of motion. Uh, here is the uh, evolution generated by the deterministic Hamiltonian. And you have the phasing in the eigenbasis of the fluctuating operator. W squared is just the uh, strength of the noise. So, <clears throat> and another yet another way of justifying the phasing, if you wish. Yeah? Uh, so let's let's see what kind of game we can play with with this. So the, maybe the idea I have in mind is to consider, for instance, in a given quantum simulator, uh, pick up your favorite platform, where trapped ions or Rydberg gases or uh, superconducting qubits. And you know, imagine that you simulate the, trans, uh, the transverse field in model, or you know, just a, a spin Hamiltonian in general, and you will have spin-spin uh, interactions giving rise to two-body operators, and there will be control fields such as a magnetic field, uh, which couples to the magnetization, so essentially a one-body operator. So now you can play a game. You can decide to add noise to any of the coupling constants. So say. We choose the uh, magnetic field, which couples to couples to the magnetization, and you ask the question: you know, what, what's the effect of this noise uh, in the magnetic field, uh, in the, and what's the the coherence time scale that it produces? Yes, so the coherence at the level of the noise average density metrics. So first, we can show that the dissipator in this case is just given by the double commutator of the magnetization, which is the fluctuating operator. This guy is the fluctuating operator. I can, of course, plug its definition, and you get a double sum of Pauli matrices at different sites with some uh, strength. Yeah? And when I use the formula of the covariance of the Lindblad operators, which are here are now the magnetization, to estimate the decoherence time, you see that it is suppressed as inverse of a polynomial or a uh, you know, uh, of the system size, number of spins, power two, yeah, one over n squared. Okay, so this is what happens when you add noise to magnetic field. What if you add noise to the spin-spin, uh, either ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic interactions? Well, in this case, you can imagine, you know, the Lindblad operator is going to be the whole spin-spin interaction term, which involves a double sum over uh, Pauli matrices, and therefore it's a bit more complicated. You, you just have a, a, sum over four indices uh, with Pauli matrices at different sites, yeah? product of Pauli matrices at different sites. Well, again, you can use the cute formula for, for the, the coherence time. And then what you see, it is suppressed as a system size to the fourth power. Yeah? OK, so here I'm introducing the notion of scaling of the coherence time with the system size uh, as a result of, of, of whether I, I add noise to one body or two body operators. Well, just for completeness, let me consider the general case where I, I, I add, I consider a Lindblad operator, which now is k-local, it's a k-body operator, so it's not one body or two bodies, it's k-body. And I look at the uh, effective uh, dissipator, and it, it is a sum over 2k indices, and you know, sum over alpha, yes, if there are more than one, uh, but you know, it's, 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 the, it's the generalization to the k-body case. Uh, and this, of course, means that somehow noise uh, occurs uh, coherently over parts, over cable parts of, of, of the system. So it's, we are kind of mimicking a correlated environment. So, uh, in this case, of course, uh, you know, you compute the, uh, the coherence time and you'll find that it's suppressed as a polynomial of order 2k, where k is the, uh, the locality of the interactions. Good. So, you know, as long as you have Hamiltonians with cable interactions, the decoherence time cannot, uh, you know, it is suppressed as a poly polynomial of the system size, which is already, you know, this can be a huge suppression. 
but uh, you don't get anything beyond that. This can be a very short time scale. Right? But the question is how, how small, you know, how crazily fast can the coherence uh, kick in? So let me now, yeah, you know, it's extreme decoherence, yes. Uh, so I have set the states uh, to bring an element of chaos. Uh, and here I'm going to follow very much the idea that uh, features of quantum chaotic systems can be described uh, by uh, random matrix theory. In particular, some spectral features such as uh, the level spacing or maybe the density of the states. Uh, so, the, uh, yes, as a background, you know, the standard references on, on random matrices. Uh, these are matrices built of, uh, of uh, elements which are sampled from uh, uh, Gaussian distribution and in which we impose some global symmetries, such as uh, being, you know, uh, unitary matrices or orthogonal matrices or um, symplectic matrices and so on. And this uh, classification in terms of symmetries gives rise to ensembles. And so these are, for instance, the Gaussian unitary ensemble or the Gaussian orthogonal ensembles and so on. Um, <clears throat> and as I say, these this, this ensembles of random matrices are able to capture features of uh, physical systems which exhibit chaos. So, you know, typical features are the density of states, the distribution of eigenvalues. Uh, so here you see what you get for uh, Hilbert space dimension of 100 in the Gaussian unitary ensemble. There's some, some uh, small modulations, barely visible, but you can clearly see that this approaches a, a semicircle. Uh, this is the well-known Birner semicircle law, uh, which describes the density of states uh, in any Gaussian ensemble in the limit of large, uh, large uh, dimension. So this is one feature which will be key, uh, but uh, there's all, there are others, we will come back to them. There's the level of spacing, which is uh, essentially maybe the, mo the most relevant, but for the time being, I'm going to focus on the density of states. Good, so what, what is what I'm going to do is to propose the game of, okay, imagine that you're Hamiltonian, uh, now the system includes a uh, deterministic part, but also a stochastic part as we have done before, but instead of being a one body or K body or operator, I'm going to choose the limbla, the fluctuating operator as uh, from an uh, ensemble of random matrices. Just for the sake of illustration, I, I choose the Gaussian unitary ensemble because that's uh, the one in which computations can be done more efficiently. Well, I then have the task, you know, of course, I want to estimate how the, the coherence time changes when I do such a thing. In principle, it's a bit crazy to add a random matrix operator to, to your system. Uh, so hopefully we get something uh, different. And uh, the, now I, I do need to compute the, the coherence time. Uh, the, the coherence time uh, when, for the case of uh, fluctuating Hamiltonians is essentially just given in terms of the uh, variance. So this is one nice feature of, of this formula. Uh, it reduces to just the variance of the Limblad operators. So this is, uh, you know, when I, I sample over uh, this uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble is what I have to compute. So yes, a bit of a technical slide, uh, you know, there are standard ways of doing average, averages over ensembles of random matrices. And uh, in this case, for the Gaussian unitary ensemble, uh, what you see is that the, uh, the average over the average splits in, into a term, which is just the eigenvalue uh, endpoint, eigenvalue distribution of the in, the in that ensemble. And there's a component, which is the hard, uh, the hard average, which uh, were, uh, is the left and right unique invariant uh, measure of the unitary group. It's, it's, it's standard ways of computing this. And so I just want to focus on the physics. If I now choose this, uh, you know, a master equation with the facing where the Limblad operators are sampled from the uh, random matrix Gaussian unitary ensemble, what I do get, which is different, is now that the uh, the coherence rate is proportional to the Hilbert space dimension. That means, you know, it's exponential on the system size that I have in in in, in qubits. Say, so I claim that this is the fastest the coherence can happen. And that no other physical system, you know, will decohere faster than this. Uh, so th this is the notion of extreme decoherence that we in introduced. Yes. <clears throat> so this, you know, and 
this is in contrast with the case that we saw before, where even if you consider you know, one and two body and four body operators, uh, the, the coherence rate was at most polynomial. So not exponential, but uh, polynomial. Yeah. So even you know you just can consider one of the Hamiltonians, which is uh, been discussed. You know, is, uh, has uh, chaotic uh, features in the spectrum. Uh, but you know, ultimately, the Sarvegi Kitayet model is a model of Majorana fermions uh, with four body all pole interactions and uh, quench disorder. In this case, if you compute the decoherence rate as a function of the number of Majorana, Majorana fermions, the, the system size, you see that it grows polynomially. Yeah, so it's very uh, slow, I mean, relatively slow here. While if you compare it with uh, Gaussian unitary ensemble, uh, you know, uh, the, the growth is much, much faster. Yeah, so this will be extreme. This is not extreme yeah? in, the, in the way in which we have defined it. Uh, so I want to uh, discuss the coherence a bit more broad, more broadly, and also in uh, introduce entanglement. So in order to do that, I'm going to consider not just one copy of the system, but two copies. Uh, and what I do uh, I, is just to consider two identical copies and add noise to each of them independently. So the uh, left one and the right one will have its their uh, the, the stochastic components. So I have here two. Uh, Gaussian real processes which are independent. Yeah? But otherwise, for simplicity, I consider they have the same strength. Uh, when I do the time average uh, description, uh, sorry, the, the, the noise average description, so I, I average over many realizations of the noise to look at what's the, uh, uh, the state of the system that describes the noise average um, ensemble. Then I see that I have two limited operators. One just acts on, on the left copy and does nothing in, on the right copy. And the other one is uh, the identity in the left copy and, and just acts on the uh, right copy. So here, because I'm adding specifically, I am justifying you know, that the limit of the fluctuations, the, the, the fluctuating operator is also the system Hamiltonian. So this is what I'm doing this. So this, if you want a particular case uh, of the general setting I discussed before, and, uh, but it's natural for random matrices. Um, so, uh, so here, limblad operators are proportional to the system Hamiltonian, uh, this guy and this guy. And what I'm going to consider as an entangled, entangled state is actually the thermophil double state uh, that describes uh, the purification of a thermal state of a single copy of the system. And as we know, this can be always done in a bigger Hilbert space. So if I take two copies, now I can describe a thermal state of a single copy as an entangled state in the, in the uh, Hilbert space of the two copies. And what you see now is that the um, uh, uh, amplitudes that describe the, uh, the superposition are just the square root of the Boltzmann factors. Yes? So if I trace over the right copy or I trace over the left copy, of the, uh, then I will get back the thermal state of, of the remaining copy. So this is the, the setting I want to have. Uh, you know, for this case, since I chose the limited operators proportional to the system Hamiltonian, it's very simple. I can uh, solve the exact dynamics for the density matrix. And what I see is that, you know, apart from having the uh, real amplitudes that I already have, the square root of the Boltzmann factors, the state picks up as a dynamical phase as its tool because you know it's evolving with its own system Hamiltonian. But the effect of the coherence, and here there's a this this will be a minus, not a plus, is actually to suppress coherences in the energy eigenbasis. Yes. Um, so it turns out uh, that uh, knowledge of this uh, exact solution simplifies the computation of uh, some properties such as the purity that we introduced before. So this is the trace of the square of the density matrix and making use of uh, uh, integral relations, so called Havar Stratanovich uh, relation, I can uh, rewrite this Gaussian factor in terms of, an, you know, by introducing an auxiliary variable. Uh, I should, I'm packing here an integral over uh, D of Y. So Y is the auxiliary variable. But essentially the point is that the purity can be written as uh, the, analytic continuation of the partition function at complex inverse temperature shifted by some auxiliary variable y. 
and I have a Gaussian term, you know, uh, uh, which if you wish is kind of a filter function, and the integral over this gives me the purity exactly. So I can compute the expression of the purity. And from the short time asymptotics, we have the, the, the identity for the, the coherence rate. And the, the coherence rate is here just proportional to the energy variance, to the energy fluctuations uh, times gamma, which is the, the constant which governs the, uh, here the, the strength of the fluctuations. Now, well, so the, this is actually you know, a standard calculation. You know, once I have everything in terms of the uh, partition function, it's, it's very simple. And I can compute uh, what's the, the coherence rate and study how it scales with the system size. Uh, so this is a plot of the purity average over the Gaussian unitary ensemble for a thermophile double state for Hilbert space dimension uh, five. And I plot it as a function of time uh, in units of uh, inverse gamma. And I do this at infinite temperature and at uh, some, some finite temperature. Sorry, this is a, a beta equal one and, and, and a small beta. So you see, uh, it's monotonic. This is a property of unital uh, maps, of, you know, which are in which the purity decays monoton monotonically. Yeah, and uh, it uh, saturates at a plateau. The plateau is very easy to estimate. It's essentially uh, the partition function at two beta divided by uh, the partition function square, uh, and. Uh, the decay time scale is completely ruled out by the, the coherence time we have introduced. So it's, it's, you know, it's monotonic decay set by the coherence time until you reach a plateau, which is uh, the asymptotic one. You can see <clears throat> that uh, at long times, you know, again, this is a minus sign. So this, this imposes no coherences in the energy eigenbasis. So essentially, this will give you a, a delta function uh, j equal k. So this time goes to zero, this time uh, kills, and essentially have a double sum, and that's how I get the plateau, uh, this, this, this uh, plateau at long times. Good, so this is the, what you see for, for the purity. Uh, now we can uh, study you know, from the short time asymptotics, which is essentially just the decay here, uh, which again, you know, just the exponential uh, covers the whole regime, but yes, from the short time asymptotics, I can extract the, the coherence time, and what I see is that uh, as a function of the system size of the Hilbert space dimension, it grows uh, linearly uh, only for all values of the system size when I am really at infinite temperature, beta equals zero. For any finite temperature, what I have is that there's a regime where effectively I, I do have uh, a proportionality with the Hilbert space dimension. But after that, uh, there's the onset of a, of a plateau. Yeah, so it saturates. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, analytically, I do have the expression that I can solve. Uh, sorry, I'm using two different letters for the Hilbert space dimension. One is n and the other is d. Here, it's exactly the same thing. And <clears throat> I just want to say that, you know, I can solve that, uh, Hilbert, uh, the coherence rate is proportional to the Hilbert space dimension, uh, essentially only at either infinite temperature or uh, small system sizes. Yes. So, but this is essentially the, the prediction of how how crazy the coherence can be. Uh, so, you know, there, there you have it. Um, maybe yes. You know, so so uh, much of the uh, discussion of the thermophile double state was inspired uh, by ADS CFT. So I don't want to um, um, go into in, into much detail. But you know, the thermophile double state is dual. Uh, uh, in principle, describes uh, black holes in uh, ADS, and one may wonder where if one has this setting where we have, you know, two copies, two entangled copies with uh, independent uh, noises of uh, sources of noise in each of the copies, how fast will uh, they cohere a black hole? Uh, uh, and here, the the coherence rate is proportional to the heat capacity, and what is known already in the literature uh, works by Papadimas and Rayu that the uh, heat capacity scales at most polynomially with uh, the system with the number of degrees of freedom. So again, the coherence will not be extreme in this case. I have mentioned this for, for those interested in the high energy physics part. <clears throat> Good, so a summary of, of the first part of this talk, you know, I, we saw how by adding noise, uh, we can uh, engineer or simulate open quantum systems in the laboratory. Uh, even if our system is isolated, just by considering many realizations of the noise. 
if we add noise to uh, coupling constants of local operators, uh, the coherence rate is suppressed as a polynomial of the system size. Uh, if we add uh, random matrix uh, uh, operators, noise to uh, the coupling constants of random matrix operators, you know, this is a very non-local uh, fluctuating operator, then we can have this exponential dependence, which we term extreme the coherence. Good. So I, I want to switch gears a bit. Uh, it's going to be uh, in the same setting, but uh, a bit of a different question, uh, which is really the one advertised in the, in the title of the talk, which is the interplay between uh, quantum chaos and the coherence. Because so far, I have focused pretty much on the coherence. And the only thing I say is, if the system is described by random matrix uh, theory, then the coherence can be extreme. Or maybe as a comment. So there's a bit of a discussion as to how to normalize uh, uh, the density of states or you know the, the ensembles in the um, in the in in in, in <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so how, how to normalize the density of states in random in, in random matrix uh, Hamiltonians? And there are different conventions. Uh, the argument I have used here by construction is if I have one body, two body, three body, four body operators then adding these higher order body terms induce uh, polynomial uh, scaling of the coherence rate of order k. <clears throat> of course, if I renormalize the Hamiltonian, the norm of the Hamiltonian, I can kill this dependence. <laughs> but you know, uh, so, so I, I'm some, in some cases, people uh, make sure that when you look at the density of states, uh, this is always in a compact support, say minus two, two or minus one, one. This, of course, will kill the notion of extreme the coherence I have introduced because it's set by the energy variance of the Limblad operators. If I choose the Limblad operators to be the Hamiltonian, you know, I, I can control the coherence rate by changing the, the scaling of the density of the states. But my justification is I'm introducing this idea that if I have one, two body, three body operators, once I consider k local operators where k is proportional to the system size, I will have extreme the coherence. Yeah, so this this is the this this is the notion of extreme the coherence we have introduced. Good. <clears throat> so, as I say, let's let's now. Oops. Oh, went far too far too quickly. Right. So let's now focus on this interplay between quantum chaos and and the coherence. Yes. So. First of all, uh, I want to clarify that this is a uh, you know uh, open problem which has been around for a few decades. Uh, so it's not um, this is a talk, and not the place to summarize all the work that has been done. There are seminal results, such as for instance these beautiful studies in phase space, where you saw if you have a system in isolation, uh, maybe the phase space uh, looks very blurry even when you use Birner uh, function approach. Uh, so here a system is taken that its classical counterpart is known to be chaotic. So, you know, it has nice, nice chaotic features. Now, if you add the coherence to the quantum system, you can see the emergence of classical features. Yeah? So this is a quantum system with the coherence. So these are works by Salman Habib and Surek and so on. It's one of the ways in which you can study this interplay between uh, quantum chaos and the coherence. So emergence of classical chaos from a quantum system. Yeah? Uh, this is not what I'm going to focus. Yeah? I just want to mention also there are several books, even uh, you know, the whole book uh, fully focused on, on, on this by uh, Brown. Uh, but this follows a semi-classical approach, which again, I'm not going to follow. Yeah? And there are some recent works studying talk and uh, you know, out of time order correlators and interplay with the coherence. What I want to do is to focus on the spectral properties and just from the spectral properties, discuss how uh, the coherence can uh, kick in. And in, in order to do that, I'm going to introduce an analog of the spectral form factor. So first, what's, you know, how do we typically, at least one of the standard ways of describing uh, uh, features of chaotic systems is in terms of partition functions with complex value temperature. They have already appeared. Essentially, I'm talking about this, this kind of term, yes? So if I, I look at the partition function, I, I can normalize it by, by its value for real temperature. And uh, if I just expand the definition in terms of the density of states, this is this is what I have, and this is just the complex Fourier transform of the product of two density of states at different values of energy. If I have a Hamiltonian ensemble, uh, well, then uh, essentially all this integral is uh, 
uh, if, I, if, if I have a Hamiltonian ensemble, then I face the problem of how to uh, take averages over ratios of terms which go with Hamiltonian sense. So this, uh, essentially, we don't know how to do it. So there's an approximation, so-called anil approximation, which works well when temperature is high. That essentially say, well, you know, yes, yes, look at the ratio of the averages. You, you substitute the average of the ratio by the ratio of the averages. And that you can check numerically, it works well when temperature is high. In this anil approximation, what we have is if we take the ensemble average of, uh, of the partition function in the complex plane over an ensemble of Hamiltonians, then what appears here is the uh, uh, essentially is the two point function. So you see why this, you know, this is the typical fit, um, uh, a typical quantity to characterize the spectral uh, features. Of course, it has a disconnected and a connected part. But, you know, this, this is a reason why uh, these complex partition functions are useful in the characterization of uh, isolated uh, chaotic quantum systems. Now, what is it that you look, for instance, take the Sagreb Yikitayot model or any other chaotic system? Uh, uh, I mentioned the Hamiltonian before. You, you plot the um, partition function uh, for complex temperature beta plus it as a function of t, the imaginary part. Then what you typically see is a decay from unit value, uh, some uh, fluctuations, and then there's a noisy part which reaches kind of a minimum, and then it starts to grow and it kind of flattens out with lots of noise. This is what happens when you choose a single realization of a chaotic uh, Hamiltonian. So this is essentially the first, uh, the first equation here. Now, if you average over an ensemble of Hamiltonians, the behavior is smooth out. You see essentially the same features, decay from unit value, then there's some kind of oscillations, but you see that all this noise uh, is being suppressed and you see a clear uh, dip with a ramp and a plateau. So just to fix a bit um, some, some other features. So this uh, high frequency fluctuations in time, uh, which is really imaginary part of temperature, uh, are were described um, and have been termed quantum noise and you know, they are just due to the accumulated phase. And uh, in the uh, all prominent features are the appearance of this deep ramp and plateau, uh, which have been much discussed uh, recently, in particular in the context of uh, high energy physics, but do, do also have precedence in, in, in the study of Rosmith echoes and even in NMR experiments. So this is you know, one standard characterization when you have a quantum chaotic system in isolation in the absence of the coherence. Uh, one thing I like it is, uh, oh, by the way, and this uh, nice nice work uh, by my collaborator, Thomas Crossen, that, you know, essentially this ramp um, that you see here is, you, you can associate it uh, with, you, know, you can think of it as an intrinsically chaotic uh, part of the dynamics, a, a part of the dynamics which is completely dominated by chaos. And it was uh, used as such in, in some studies, yes. So in, in a sense, if, if you have a nice ramp, then you will say that, you know, there's, there's a parts of the dynamics, you know, this is, will be fully chaotic uh, regime. <clears throat> and the, the span of this region is something I'm going to discuss later. Uh, so I, I like this, this quantity, this uh, analytic continuation of the partition function, because I understand it from a uh, point of view of quantum dynamics. And, and this is something that I love. Yeah? So uh, this is something I learned from the work by Papadoimas and Rayu. So essentially, uh, they, uh, in, the, in the context of black hole physics in ADSCFT, they were using thermophile double to describe uh, uh, you know, a, a black hole. And uh, if you evolve it just with the uh, Hamiltonian of the two non-interacting copies, what you see is the state uh, at a later time, the thermophile double uh, is given by this expression, where the only thing that has happened is that uh, the Boltzmann factors, which were real, have acquired a dynamical phase uh, to IT, uh, the eigenvalue. And now, if you ask what is the probability that this state is found on the initial thermophile double state? So if you ask what's the survival probability of the uh, uh, time-evolved thermophile double in the initial state, then you do get exactly 
this uh, expression, which is the one I have just discussed, yeah? the uh, partition function con continue to complex uh, value temperatures. So this is a physical, you know, this is a, an experiment that you can conceive. And by the way, uh, maybe you don't need a thermophile double, you could also do it with a single copy of the system. If you prepare what is called a coherent uh, Gibson state and you just evolve it with its own uh, Hamiltonian, then if you look at the uh, survival probability, you still get that this is governed or given in terms of the um, uh, uh, absolute square value of the partition function at complex index temperature. <clears throat> right, so, so this, this uh, understanding that I, the, the problem could be rephrased as a problem of quantum decay of the survival probability uh, prompt us to write uh, this work in which we exploit all, all features of quantum decay, short-time asymptotics, long-time asymptotics, some uh, Paley linear theorems, some features that appear in, from, from yes, Fourier analysis that allow you to, to constrain and to tell what are going to be the features of this quantity. Um, and here is, okay, the, the, the main part of the talk, I will say it's just this slide. So I want to do is to propose the generalization to open systems, and I'm going to do it by exploiting this dynamical perspective in which I take the initial state as the uh, pure quantum state of the and uh, two copies of the system, the thermophile double. And now I evolve it not with their uh, unitary dynamics associated with their Hamiltonian, but with an arbitrary quantum channel. So my initial state evolves under some evolution, which can be uh, completely general. So I will have a linear, uh, completely positive trace preserving map, uh, you know, which, which could be described by a Markovian equation or not, could be more general. And then what I'm going to claim that is a good uh, notion uh, to a good quantity to characterize the interplay of quantum chaos and decoherence is the survival probability of the initial state, which is the thermophile level. And it's time evolution. So it's very simple, yeah? It's just by analogy with the unitary case. Good, so let's see what this is actually useful or good or, or, or what. Uh, so as I said, this is, I guess, maybe the main take home message, yeah? Well, so let me come back to the setting I discussed before. I consider the two copies <clears throat> of, of, of uh, you know, a, a thermophile double state involving two copies of the system. So this is the, the Hamiltonian of the left copy and the plus the right copy without any interaction between the two. Uh, I add noise to both of them, and I end up with this uh, Markovian master equation, where I have limited operators which are the Hamiltonian in one in one copy and Hamiltonian in the other. Yeah. So this is, this is what we did exactly before. Uh, maybe now without typos because I, I read the density matrix and I have the, the exact expression with the Gaussian factor uh, with the difference and the energy. Now I can compute the fidelity, which is the quantity I have just proposed as a good generalization of the. Uh, to, to the spectral form factor to open quantum systems. And immediately you can see again that at long times the Gaussian factor is going to, to kill coherences in the energy eigenbasis. And the, in the absence of degeneracies in the energy spectrum, I can write down the uh, asymptotic value uh, in terms of the partition function. Otherwise, uh, I have to take into account the degeneracies and, and this, the numerator will be just yes, a bit different. It will, the, the, the sum over n of the square of the degeneracies times the Boltzmann factor. Good. Um, so <clears throat> uh, this is a beautiful result, which was derived by Aurelia. So Aurelia Senu. She was able to rewrite the fidelity. So essentially, this, this expression in terms of the spectral form factor of a system in isolation. So, so really, the quantity we introduced before. So it's the, the absolute square value of the partition function at complex temperature times a Gaussian term, which if you wish can be considered a filter function. So you see uh, here, you explicitly see that defacing in the energy eigenbasis is, induces just a coarse graining of the unitary result. So in many studies, uh, one uses coarse graining in a, a hoc fashion just to suppress quantum noise and to get the plateau at long times. But here, this is an exact identity of, that just comes from rewriting the solution of the uh, master equation for the decohering uh, system, yes? And you see, you know, it's really kind of a Gaussian factor where the width of the Gaussian increases with time and it's modulated by the strength of, of the fluctuations in the system Hamiltonian, so the strength of the decoherence. And it also shifts its center to uh, T essentially proportional with time. So it's something that is becoming broader 
and it's shifted into longer time sense. So it's kind, kind of sampling, of course, graining the, the uh, spectral form factor for, for isolated systems, but in, in, a, in a peculiar form as a function of, of, of time. Um, okay, so, so maybe two technical slides, but the only point I want to make is we have seen that the purity decays monotonically. So you may, uh, you may consider alternative quantities to the fidelity. And I, I just want to show that these other quantities will also decay monotonically. And they, they also give us some insight. So we are considering the decoherence of a thermophile double state, which is an entangled state of two copies of the system. So I may, wa I may wonder what happens to entanglement due to the phasing, yes? So one of the ways of answering this question is by using an entanglement monotone, monotone, such as the logarithmic negativity. So it's just the logarithm of the partial transpose of the density matrix and taking the trace norm. Now, this can be done efficiently and give some result. Um, so it's one of the quantities we will look at. So I'm just going to show a plot, but you know, these are the, the equations uh, that are in this paper with uh, Tadasita Kayana. <clears throat> Another thing you can do is to look at Rennie entropies. So Rennie entropies are not a measure of entanglement, they're a measure of the kind of the, how mixed the quantum state is. Uh, so uh, they are defined in terms of the log of the trace of the uh, power of, of the density matrix. And when the, uh, this exponent is an uh, integer, one can use replica trick to uh, take many copies of the system and essentially do the calculation and again get, uh, get a result. Well, fine. So I just want to show you that you can compute things like logarithmic negativity and Rene entropies. How do they look like? Well, uh, so let me just mention, let's study them in the satellite geek target model as a, test, as a test bed. And here is what happens to the logarithmic negativity as a function of time for a thermophile double state in this YK model. Uh, I'm using averaging over 100 realizations of the uh, quench disorder. Remember that the uh, satellite geeky type model has, has a, a disorder part. So I'm essentially using an ensemble of Hamiltonians. You see, logarithmic negativity decays uh, monotonically. In, and again, this time scale is governed by the, the coherence time. It will remain constant if the dynamics is unitary, of course. If, uh, then we know that because the logarithmic negativity is an entanglement monotone. Uh, you know, it's going to be invariant under uh, just uh, the uh, unitary dynamics, which is generated by uh, Hamiltonians that act independently on each of the copies, and there's no, no uh, interaction term. But as you crank up uh, the uh, defacing strength, then you see that you induce a monotonic decay. Uh, if you look at the second Rene entropy, so this is essentially uh, related to the purity, we saw it before. Uh, the purity uh, and it decay monotonically. So, okay, the Rennie entropy is just minus the log of the purity. So you see that it increases monotonically and it will be, uh, it will remain constant. Uh, so if the initial state is pure, it will remain zero at all times and it only grows because of the coherence, yes? But again, the growth is completely monotonic and is governed by the decoherence. Good. How does this contrast with it? So, so you see, in, in some sense, these correlations does not, do not allow you to study the interplay between the coherence and quantum chaos. You just see that either they decay or they grow, but you know everything is monotonic and there's no interplay. Yeah? Uh, this is in contrast with the fidelity, and that's why I think this is a beautiful quantity to study. And so let's, this is one of the main numerical results. So let's look at it with, with it, uh, detail. Yeah? So I plot here this fidelity, which is the quantity we propose as analog of the spectral form factor, which again is the, the time dependent state at time t sandwiched by the initial state. If the dynamics is unitary, it reduces to the uh, standard spectral form factor. And this is the dark line where you see it decays from unit value. Now it's a fidelity. So of course it decays from unit value at time zero. Uh, and then there's uh, a decay, there's the deep, there's the fluctuations and the plateau. Now, very importantly, this is a single realization. And what we see is that defacing is already playing the uh, role of the ensemble of, of Hamiltonians because noise, these uh, uh, fluctuations have already disappeared at the level of a single realization uh, thanks to defacing. Yeah? So this is one, one main feature that you see. It's already for strong defacing. You see a very smooth curve instead of something uh, that fluctuates widely. The other feature is, of course, is that the uh, deep, uh, uh, it's shifted, its onset is shifted to later values. 
and uh, therefore it also becomes shallower. So it's not so deep as it was in the unitary case, it's becoming less and less deep. Importantly, and I think it's beautiful really, uh, the uh, ramp is essentially unaffected beyond the suppression of the quantum noise fluctuations. The ramp remains the ramp just after the dip. So the onset of the dip has been delayed. So now our the span of the dip has been reduced. Uh, but you know, for different values of the defacing strength, and the, the bigger the defacing, the narrower is this ramp. Yeah? And finally, you reach the plateau, and the plateau is pretty much insensitive to anything uh, beyond the suppression of the quantum noise. Yeah? So it doesn't matter, you know, already with moderate uh, defacing strengths, uh, you have a good suppression of the quantum noise. Good. So these are the, the main four features that we see here. The plateau is robust, the ramp is shortened, but otherwise is robust and uh, quantum noise is suppressed at the level of a single single realization. Yes. <clears throat> well, if you do many realizations, uh, so you, know, you put the, the phasing, uh, the coherence, but also consider an ensemble of Hamiltonians, then of course you didn't have any noise from the start because then some Hamiltonian ensemble average already kills the, the noise as we saw. And then you just see more clearly that the effect of the decoherence is to shift uh, the delay, the appearance of the deep, and then the uh, ramp remains untouched, essentially, and then you just follow uh, into the plateau. <clears throat> so most quantities were monotonic. When we studied purity, the logarithmic negativity, uh, the Rennie entropies, they all were essentially displaying a unique time scale, which was the decoherence time. We see now that the fidelity is sensitive not only to the coherence time, but it's sensitive to the deep time, which is not quite a thousand time, but uh, it's sensitive to the plateau, uh, the onset of the plateau and the Heisenberg time, which is this time scale where the ramp finishes and, and reaches the plateau. Um, one can do estimates for a given model of these time scales. So, you know, we know that the coherence time scale very well. This is what I devoted the first part of the talk to characterize and uh, then, uh, so this is for the started geek type model, so, so, uh, and the underestimates of the deep and the plateau time for the system in uh, isolation. So we can uh, understand, you know, the behavior of the fidelity or the survival probability of the thermal field double state in terms of the interplay of these of these time scales, yeah? so these three time scales. And as the plateau, you know, is pretty robust, essentially nothing happens there. Essentially, it's going to be the ratio of the first two time scales, the, the, the coherence time and the deep time, which uh, are, is more prominent. Yeah? And here is what you see if I plot the coherence time uh, versus the deep time uh, as a function of the system size, I see that this is something that decays. So, this is for a specific model, so the big target model. And uh, the fact that it's getting smaller and smaller with the system size tells me that for a given strength of the defacing, uh, chaos survives in the sense that there is a part of the ramp that survives because the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, deep time grows faster, essentially, than the coherence time. Now, these were, well, these were the time scales of the system in isolation, but the other thing we can do is to you know, read uh, the shift of the new deep uh, and the new plateau times as a function of defacing, yes? So we can do this numerically for given values of you know, system size and different values of, of the defacing strength. You see that the, the Heisenberg time, so the time of appearance of the uh, plateau is pretty much unchanged. So, and this, you can see in this plot. So if I just look at the plateau and I compare a numerical simulation of unitary dynamics with a numerical simulation uh, with the coherence, uh, the, I plot here the plateau time or the Heisenberg time as a function of the system size, and you know, points fall on top of each other with and without the coherence, I see exactly the same behavior. The coherence time is, of course, unique to the coherence. Otherwise, there is, you know, so uh, you, you can just study the dependence on the system size. And the, the deep, you can see how the deep is shifted uh, as a function of the system size for different values of, of, of gamma. Yeah? So we had a dependence on the in the isolated case, and you know, depending on, on, on gamma, it takes different values. Good. So I think this is the, the last one of the last slides. So what I want to show here is then what's the ratio between the deep time and the plateau time. So what's the span 
or, I mean, I could have taken the difference. I, I took the ratio uh, of, of this region. Yes, I want to see how this grows uh, or how it, it, what's the dependence of the span of the ramp uh, in the presence of the coherence. So I do here for uh, three different values of the defacing strength, including the isolated case and two dissipative cases uh, as a function of the system size. And OK, here we are limited by uh, system size. Uh, numerical simulations with the GKTI model, we can probe only relatively small systems. But essentially, the main feature that you see is that uh, we roughly have three parallel uh, lines. And uh, that, again, means that the uh, defacing appears to suppress by a constant factor, independent of the system size, the span of the uh, chaotic regime. So again, I get, I guess the, the take home message here is a chaotic part, an intrinsically chaotic part of the dynamics associated with the ramp survives for a given value of the defacing strength as the system size is made bigger. Yeah. Uh, good. So I guess this is the summary. So, you know, the first part of the talk was about extreme decoherence and the use of uh, classical noise as a resource to engineer quantum mapping systems. And we saw it uh, by considering it in capping constants of both local and random matrix operators. And the second part of the talk, I have focused on the interplay. I have shown that most quantities decay, at least for this model of the coherence, in a very simple way, uh, monotonically. But you know, a good analog of the spectral form factor is the fidelity of the thermofield double state. And this uh, reproduces, in the isolated case, the prominent features of the spectral form factor, the coherence deep and plateau. Uh, but in the presence of defacing, these quantities are uh, the, are, 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 are changed. Uh, this time scales appear, uh, and the competition governs the, the behavior of, of this quantity. Yeah. Um, so yes, that's all what I wanted to say. So yeah, I guess uh, thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Tudo, for this great seminar. We love really beautiful results. So again, we encourage everyone to just ask questions through the chat, which we can then post to Adolfo. And I think. Well, people are thinking, I'll just kick it off with some quick questions. So can I think of this dip as kind of the equivalent of the correlation hole that people like Leo Santos have used to study quantum chaos? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this dip is, is also known in the literature of quantum chaos as correlation hole. You know, there's a bit, yeah. in there. and uh, here, if you wish, the message is that in the presence of the coherence, this, the, the, it, it's being sifted. Yeah, it's, it's dynamical manifestation is being sifted. Hmm. So then this dip would also disappear if you consider, for example, a non-interacting integrable model or what would happen? I, be I believe so. Yes, 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 yes. If it's, it's or if it's non-chaotic, if it's integrable, uh, yes, I will list it. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. I have another Yes. Yeah, so, so, so here is, I was really assuming that I have a chaotic system and I just throw in the coherence and I want to see how, to what extent chaotic features are preserved. Yeah, or how fast they are lost, or you know. Uh, but of course, if the system is non-chaotic and is integrable from the start, you know, it, it doesn't show these prominent features of the deep and and the and the ramp, which are intrinsically chaotic. Yeah, I have a, another related question. So the first part of your talk, you had this scaling of the decoherence rate with system size. And so mm -hmm. you considered completely random matrices and then matrices with local interaction, and I think. Again, on the other end of that spectrum, you have these non-attracting table systems. Do you expect similar scaling there, still polynomial, or do you expect something differently? For integrable systems? For example, in a transfer field Ising model, where I imagine you can just solve the dynamics exactly with this double commutator. Oh, yes. In any, in any Hamiltonian, you know, whether it's integrable or not, you know, uh, if I just have K body operators and you know in the transverse field is model, even if you put an axial field, it will not change the scaling. As long as you only have one and two body operators, then you can solve that the, the coherence time will not be suppressed faster than one over n to the fourth. That's the fastest it could be suppressed. Possibly it goes the suppression is um, this is lower, yeah, but uh, you know th this will be the fastest. So uh, in this case you will uh, the coherence will not be extreme. Extreme is very weird. Yeah, it's a, it's a rare esoteric uh, setting. It's not the typical thing you are going to find. You will have to engineer it. I mean, I guess uh, cases where it appears, for instance, if you have a fully non-local term uh, Hamiltonian with all to all uh, interact, uh, 
No, but even Lipkin Meskov Lip model, you, your interactions are two body. They are all two body, but they are two body. So, uh, you know, in this sense, will not be as, uh, extreme either. Yeah. It's only if I have the relatively um, physical Hamiltonians where, you know, that, that they arise in a set of context, you know, by making some kind of uh, quantum measurements and so on. So, uh, but the, to really have a random matrix Hamiltonian, no, no, you see, it's not that the spectral features of the Hamiltonian are described by random matrices. It's really that the uh, Hamiltonian is described by a random matrix. That's what we are doing. It's re you know, you should understand that it's relatively esoteric because, you know, in principle, a random matrix involves one body, two body, three body, four body, n body operators. Yes, and this is not something you know. We typically are happy with one and two body and maybe three body interactions, but you know, typically we don't go beyond that. Uh, of course, they can they can be simulated uh, in some quantum platforms. Uh, there are several proposals out there, and they also arise in a variety of contexts. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. So chat. I have. One. Okay. Can I do one, Peter? So. Um, in the so when in, in you know when you analyze the open I mean the dynamics of the thermal field double and you know when you choose the operator that couples to a noise you choose the Hamiltonian right um, and so of, you know I see how that you know is is really beneficial to solving the model but do you, do you have any notion to what happens if you uh, couple you know to some other operator? Right, like to say, you know, this this noise is actually I don't know some noise. If you this if it is a spin system, this is actually stochastic noise, uh, you know, along some direction. Um, do you expect uh, part of these results to still hold? And, and by these results, you mean the scaling of the coherence time, or you mean fidelity? Fidelity. Ah, so that I can just tell you that we are working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so, so we are trying to, yeah, yeah, exactly, you know, so we, we were very much focused on the context of uh, energy diffusion, energy defacing in thermophile double motivated by, you know, uh, ADSFT and all other, all other contexts, yes. Uh, but we just realized that, you know, this may be, uh, you know, pretty more general. And we, we are now trying to characterize systematically uh, how, you know, different, different kind of defacing channels, not just energy diffusion. Yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, govern the uh, uh, the fidelity. Yeah. yeah, I don't think I have much more to say. Of course, most of the analytical relations that I presented will be lost unless the uh, defacing, you know, unless the channel is a channel of uh, defacing with some operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian, where right. then we will have similar things. Otherwise, it will be very different. And how different? It's it's a very good question, and it's intrinsically interesting. And we hope to uh, discuss it. Yeah. I think we have a question which was very related, but I don't know, Peter. Yeah, there's a question in the chat from Diego Wisniaki, who's also congratulating you on the nice talk. He's asking, the, the, the relation between chaos and decoherence depends on the way you model the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, of course, sure. In general, it does, yes. Uh, so all, uh, yeah, so I, I, I guess it is indeed very related because all the results I have presented are focused on energy diffusion. So this is the phasing in the uh, energy eigenbasis. Uh, the phasing in the energy eigenbasis can be justified, as I mentioned, in a variety of contexts, yes, but it's not universal, yeah? So uh, then the question is, it, sure, the interplay between quantum chaos and the coherence is going to depend explicitly on the kind of defacing channel, uh, on the kind of quantum channel, on the kind of the coherence mechanism you have, on the kind of uh, environment and system environment interaction that you have. Yeah. You know, you could think of, uh, you know, go into more semi-classical models, you could think of coupling your system to a caldera electric bath, yeah, a bunch of harmonic oscillators with what kind of coupling? You could choose bilinear, you could choose something more complex. Yes? And then it will change the features. Yes? But I think that what is interesting is once you have a given environment with a given interaction, once you have a given open quantum dynamics, how can I characterize the survival <laughs> of the quantum chaotic features? And again, I'm not using uh, the kind of approach which have been discussed in the literature using semi-classical methods or emergence of classical chaos from quantum uh, description. I'm just focusing on the spectral features which we uh, attribute to quantum chaos 
to what extent these are preserved or, or how they are modified in the presence of a given open quantum dynamics. But this, I agree, is fully dependent on the kind of the coherence mechanism that we have. OK, thanks a lot. And I think that concludes this week's seminar. So thanks a lot again to Adolfo for this well, great talk. Thank you all for, for your attention. Yeah, thanks for listening. And thanks for the invitation. It's been fun. Uh, and also next week, we'll have Annabella Bord from the Technical University of Munich. We'll be talking about probing dynamics in quantum simulators. So if people want to get updates, you can subscribe to this channel or you can subscribe to the mailing list, which you can do just in the description of this video. So thanks again and hopefully see you next week. Bye. Yeah, cheers.